Welcome. This is the first lecture in a series of five regarding the history of Sweden. This lecture will encompass prehistory and the history up until the end of the Viking Age. While I am trained as an historian, I am first and foremost an engineer. And lastly, there are many more people better suited to give lectures regarding the history of Sweden. I've also tried to stay away from Swedish and local history as much as possible during my education. And this makes me even less suited. But I've anyhow been asked to do this, and there seems to be a lack of this type of content available in English, so I'll do it anyway. The content, which I have encountered, is either very, very meme friendly or concentrated around a narrow selection of Swedish history. I made my best to pick out content which would interest a more global audience and thus I've tried to steer away from petty local struggles, something which might distort the picture if one looks to history for a more local perspective. If you would like to take a deeper dive into non-academic Swedish history, I can heartily recommend Hermann Lindqvist, a man who made me curious about the world when I was a small boy. Further on I shall mention Dick Harrison who has made a name for himself explaining early Swedish history in popular media. Dealing with Swedish history before the latter half of the Middle Ages is difficult, and before the Viking Age, more or less impossible without resorting to archaeology. This rings especially true if we search for our answers regarding the history of places outside the centers of power. Thus, our view of Finland, northern Sweden, or just the heavily wooded parts of central Sweden is obscure, to say the least. Prehistory is also politized, and has been so since the emergence of naturalism. Competing narratives are still present. Did the majority of Swedes descend from a mythical race of warriors, as was proposed in the 19th century? Did Germanic tribes conquer Sweden and replace a prior population? Was the Sami present also further south before being changed northwards? Was Sweden always a partially multicultural society? This is partially the reason why I mainly stayed away from this topic until I took upon me to give you this overview. One thing is certain. During the last ice age, Sweden was slowly on the big sheets of ice. This way before Greta was born. The sheer weight of the ice pushed Sweden downward, down to the core of the earth. Once the ice started to melt, hunters followed suit and thus Sweden was populated, especially. This occurred roughly around 12,000 BC. The land itself started to change with the ice. Mountains were rounded and once the ice disappeared, the land itself started to rise up again. Thus, the shorelines, which these hunters and fishers mostly lived on, lived close to, has been moved. Most probably, fishing was of huge importance for these early settlers. In due time, there was also migration from the east, heading down from Tornio Valley, which today separates Finland and Sweden. We know quite little about these humans. Perhaps they spoke some Indo-European language. Perhaps. They looked very different from modern Swedes. Today we speak of the Sami as the indigenous people of Sweden, at least the way the northern part. When Sami became separate, if at all, from the rest of the population is however not, re not really clear, nor entirely where the Sami came from. For a long time it was assumed that the Sami had much in common with Siberian peoples, but genetic data doesn't seem to back this up. It seems quite clear that, well, or that parts of what would become the Sami arrived in Sweden shortly after the ice receding and the reindeer hunters would in time become pastoralists herding the reindeer instead of hunting it. In due time, farming spread northward and was introduced to southern Sweden, starting from around 4000 BC. This was way later than in the 11th and less obvious due to the poor, quite poor yields given by the climate. Further north, farming was even less advantageous and thus fishing and hunting remained hugely important sources of nourishment. Thus, the early Swedes didn't really become a fully settled people for a long time, living partially as hunters and partially as seasonally migrating pastoralists. In a way, this remains in some forms with hunting still being a hugely popular activity 
especially in rural areas. Many affluent Swedes also keep a secondary cottage reserved for summer use, and in a way this is akin to the Russian usage of dachas. It is uncertain exactly how farming reached Sweden, whether it was knowledge being spread or the population being partly replaced by mass migration. Roughly 2800 BC, the funnel breaker culture was mostly replaced by a new culture called the Battleaxe culture. This might have been a non-voluntary transition, as the Battleaxe is hints of. After this, the inhabitants of southern Sweden becomes an Indo-European people, and most probably a Proto-Germanic people. In time, the metal bronze came to southern Sweden roughly 1700 BC, which at this time was heavily dominated by the more populated Danish regions. Now it becomes evident that not everyone in society were equals, wealth, wealthy men amassed goods which they were buried with, and small-scale wars seems to have been quite normal. Art also starts to emerge, being carved into coastal rocks. Society revolved around waterways, and long ships became both a mythological and social symbol, as well as a tool for trade. At this time, most activity is in the southern and western parts of Sweden, and we seem to know little about Finland and Norland. In the south and west, there were mostly, most probably no clear distinction between what would become Norway, Denmark and Sweden. Iron started to emerge in Sweden roughly 400 BC. Society seems to have been changed quite a lot since there was no longer an absolute reliance on bronze, which had to be traded for. Thus, wealth amassment seems to have been slowed and society seems to have been become more equal, but perhaps also more violent due to the prevalence of weapons as burial gifts. The region also came into direct and perapial contact with the expanding Roman Empire. The Romans halted their drive north when Varus was ambushed in the Teutonberger forest, but trade with what would today be southern Sweden was evident. Obviously, there are a huge cultural influence acted upon Sweden due to the progress of civilization, including refinements in trade, agriculture, and the emergence of indigenous writing. At this time, the Swedes and Sami partially entered history since, since Tacitus seems to mention them in his book Germania. Also, the Germanic languages of the Nordic seem, seems to become more separate, thus creating a Proto-Norse language. When the migration period started, Sweden wasn't beset by the Huns, rather they profited from the chaos and more gold seems to be available in Sweden. Here the first lasting literary feats of Scandinavia emerges, such as the sagas of Beowulf and Nibelungen. Roughly around the year 400, 540, another center for Swedish culture emerges, this time based around the Lake Mela. And especially the then quite long but shallow waterways of Uppland. A boat for burial was discovered in Vandal, Uppland, and thusly the period is called the Vandal period. At this time, Uppsala emerges a culture and religious center. This is the old Uppsala, north of the modern town. It is obvious that at this time, proto-kings with mounted armored warriors emerged and they started to amass wealth in great quantities. These people were in contact with continental Europe, perhaps serving as mercenaries. Great similarities to the burial site of Sutton Hoo in England are evident, thus there were most probably quite extensive contacts with the West. In due time, society became more formalized as more kingdoms and chiefdoms were formed and less fluent than before. At this time, the Norse people seemed to have diverged culturally from the other Germanic peoples, whom to a huge degree was already Christianized and Romanized. At this time, Sweden was heavily centered around waterways and coastline, and boat building became more and more important. The Vikings were a mostly agricultural society, which supplemented their income with hunting, sealing, and trading, craftsmanship, but also raiding. In time, raiding 
became quite popular due to the obvious advantage which the bolts gave and the disparity between incomes from traditional trades and raiding. During the Viking Age, there are several cores of population in present-day Sweden. In the south, the people is less related to Mälaren and more connected to the Danish Isles, and would thus most probably also have identified them as such. This was most probably also true for the west coast of Sweden, especially since Norway and Denmark at this time was very heavily interconnected. These Vikings mostly traveled westwards, thus connecting themselves to the Danelaw in England, Norman in France, and the slaving post in Ireland and the Isles in the Atlantic. However, as we've seen in the Vendel period, there was also another core of proto Sweden sent around Mälaren, and these Vikings would, to a bigger extent, look to the east. There were of course no watertight compartments in between these cores and Vikings from Mälardalen served in the west and vice versa. But the main directions did emerge. The plains of Jötaland on both sides of Lake Vatten also started to be more heavily populated even though they were a bit further away from major waterways. At this time mythological kings of Sweden emerged, the Ynglinga dynasty claiming to be descendants from none other than Odin himself. At this time, the Sami is evidently separate, but still largely remain in proto-history, as does the rest of northern Sweden. In time, the Vikings from Mälardalen didn't just travel around the Baltic Sea, but also started to make inroads on the rivers of Eastern Europe. Of special importance were the river Neva, which in turn leads to Lake Ladoga, roughly modern-day St. Petersburg. From Ladoga it was possible to sail up the Volkhov towards the lake Ilmen. On the shores of Ilmen there were the cities of Novgorod and Stara Rosa, which was populated by Slavic peoples. In time, Vikings traveled even further southward, on the river Lovat and afterwards even crossing over the Dnieper system of rivers. In order to do this, the boats had to be rolled over land for a couple of kilometers, something which was possible due to the lightweight construction of Viking boats. Once, the Dnieper, once on the Dnieper it was possible to reach Kiev and further on the Black Sea and thus leave the Don system and the Byzantine Empire. The Daugava system of rivers was also used, sometimes to transition into the Dnieper system. This way the Vikings of Melanie came into close contact with the Baltic peoples. Vikings also sailed onto the Volga and further on down to the Caspian Sea, where Vikings came in contact with Persian and Islamic cultures. But little evidence of Islamic religion taking hold in Sweden is available. In conclusion, there was a bigger intermingling with Eastern cultures in Mälardalen than in Southern Sweden and other Norse countries. This is especially true regarding Finnic, Baltic and Slavic peoples. Sometimes these eastward facing Vikings are differentiated by using the eastern term Varangian. The main goods which the Varangians traded were slaves, and most probably all trade was heavily armed and most probably less than voluntary from time to time. In time, Scandinavian settlers, pirates and warrior kings would win the Rus as the people from Ruslagen, close to Melan were called, and they gained quite a lot of influence in this mainly Slavic proto-Russia. According to the Kronkars of Nestor, a monk of Kiev, a king called Rurik was given control of Novgorod as a compromise between local nobles. From Rurik, a dynasty would emerge, not just controlling Novgorod, but also much of the important Kiev. This dynasty would last all the way until 1598 with the death of Tsar Fyodor I. However, intermingling with local Slavic nobles was very common even during the Viking Age and a separate Varangian identity would wane. The importance of the Varangians for the Russian nation is today quite politically charged since it undermines the Slavicness of the Russian nation. The Rurikids also adopted the Orthodox Christian faith, dropping the Norse religion. Varangians would have quite close contact with the European superpowers of the time, the Byzantine Empire. 
it was possible to reach the Black Sea through the rivers of Russia, and thus the Varangians could both threaten and serve the Byzantine Empire, especially in Constantinople. The emperor used Varangians as his personal god, partly due to the perceived neutrality, but also martial prowess. In time, this became so popular that regular units were recruited. This way, the Orthodox faith, Greek and Levantine culture most probably came to Maladala. One thing is for certain, Viking graffiti came to the Hagia Sophia. In time, the Varangian god seems to have become more and more Slavic and less Norse. There were also more agricultural settlements emerging from Sweden. This way, Norse-speaking settlers settled the eastern shores of the Baltic. This is especially true for the Finnish shoreline and Åland. How lasting and permanent these settlements seems to be uh, seems to be up to scholarly debate. The distance between Maladon Archipelago and Åland Archipelago is quite low. It was also possible to settle the islands of Gotland, Dagö and Ösel. Some settlers even ventured up the Neva and settled on the shores of Ladoga. But they seem to have been assimilated quite soon. The from lakes crisscrossed interior of Finland was already inhabited by different Finnic tribes. Most of Finnish history seems to be before the Middle Ages is unknown. There seems to have been culture and low scale urban settlements, including hilltop forts, but no written accords except from outside. In time, there seems to be a crystallization of different tribes, most of the, notably the Tavastians, Karelians, and the Finns proper. The last of these had the closest contact with the rest of Scandinavia, and in due time they will, have a, they will become a very important part of Sweden. There seems to have been quite a lot of infight between the Finnic tribes, but few sources are available. In time, the Viking Age was coming to an end. Kingdoms stabilized and the kings became less mythological. Kings would have nobles, jarls below them, who in turn had free men, carls, and lastly there were the serfs. The system wasn't completely feudal, but pretty close. Sweden was slowly heading towards the Middle Ages, and Denmark was even further along, taking southern Sweden along. Raiding was becoming harder and less profitable, and thusly society became more and more agricultural. Something which the warmer climate made easier. This increased the importance of Jutland, the plains on both sides of Lake Vettan. As we have already seen, Vikings came in contact with Christianity, both Catholic and Orthodox. There would however be no true Orthodox missionary work in Sweden proper, the Orthodox missionaries would concentrate on what today is Russia. In time, the population of Scandinavia would nominally abandon the Norse faith, but not the superstitions. This was by no means a straight path, there were several setbacks for the missionaries. The most famous of these missionaries were Ansgar, heading out from Hamburg. There was Christianization from both ends of society. It was highly attractive for the serfs, whom was offered a decent afterlife, but also for rulers, who would become rulers of divine right and open up for exchange with the Christian kingdoms of Europe. Women were perhaps especially prone to convert, given the less warrior-oriented direction of Christianity and the importance of the Virgin Mary. Christianity spread faster in the south than in Maladalen, and Jutland would gain far further in importance. With the center of Sweden gravitating further south and adopting the Catholic faith, the contacts eastward started the way. At the same time, the Varangians had become very much assimilated into the new Slavic lands and adopted the Orthodox faith. This was further fueled by the very much declining slave trade on which the Varangians first relied upon. Arabic sources describing Varangians may thusly rather describe quite assimilated Varangians rather than Varangians heading out from Menadalen. The population of Sweden also started to ditch, ditch the Futark runic alphabet in favor of Latin script, while the East adopted Cyrillic script. Thusly, Sweden 
entered the Middle Ages, more closely connected to the rest of the Nordic countries, partly losing its deep connection eastwards. Many thanks for watching this lecture. If you enjoyed it, you may very well spread it along. In the next part, we'll have a look into the Middle Ages and the early Vasa dynasty kings. Until next time.